Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to Twit Wow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. And this is our Lucha Underground Review. And I'll tell you, man, what a great week of wrestling it's been. Hot off the heels of an excellent Raw, we get this tremendous episode of Lucha Underground. I, I, I mean, all the praise we've given in past episodes, I think, could be applied here. Great entering action. Great furthering of storylines. We had a nice debut of, uh, of Davari here that I liked and I think raises some intrigue, which I'd like to talk to you about when we get to that segment. So I think this show had a little bit of everything. I was thoroughly entertained for the hour and, and just, man, what a great week it's been. What did you think of it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I even said going into this show, man, Lucha Underground is consistently the best show of the week, but I'll tell you, it has some real competition this week because of Raw, because of how good Raw was, but it lived up to it completely. This show was wonderful. This show had everything that I love about Lucha Underground, from the the corny yet still amazing and awesome cinematic vignette style backstage segments, and the you know the debut was handled so well, and there was a nice brawl, and the matches were amazing as always, and we even got a heel turn that we kind of expected, but at the same time we didn't know if it would be this early, and ah, just just amazing all around as usual. I've often said when you and I discuss just the whole presentation of Lucha Underground, how I feel like they have such confidence with their balancing act of all of these stories, all rushing towards, you know, this one particular direction, it seems like. And tonight, I think, just shows why they are that confident. Just so well done how everything was structured. But with that said, let's get right into our first segment, Heat of the Night. I have zero heats the night tonight, not even a nitpick. This show was on point. Yeah, same here. All right, with that said, let's roll right on through to our Lucha Underground review. And I know we get a recap of, you know, events in the preceding weeks. And then I believe we open up with our, our first cinematic kind of scene, if I'm not mistaken, Ashton, Dario Cueto in his office, or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, this was actually available to watch on uh, Lucha Underground's YouTube channel prior to the show tonight. Uh, we opened up with the, a video that's been online. It's uh, an opening in, in Cueto's office with Johnny Mundo and Alberto El Patron, and they both want a title shot, and they both agree that um, even though each one of them thinks that they are specifically the better between the two, that both of them deserve a title shot over Hernandez. And uh, what Cueto basically interprets that as is, oh, well, you guys want to fight Hernandez, but it wouldn't be fair to him to have a triple threat. So he puts them against each other, and the winner faces Hernandez next week to determine the new number one contender. Oh, man, Lucha Underground really knows how to stick it to me. Because first they give, like, the one-on-one -on -one match with Patron with Mundo, and they have world championship implications, the one-two punch. So this is a really well-done segment. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm actually glad... You know, they addressed it in this way because, you know, I've even been saying, of course, as a Mundo Mark, but even more sincerely, like, you know, what about Mundo's championship match? He beat Cuerno in a steel cage. And yep. Patron, well, I mean, his name value, you knew he was going to be in the title picture eventually, especially after he uh, got through with this stuff with Tejano. So I feel like they handled the beefs of both of these legitimate contenders very well. It keeps the heat on Cueto, you know, kind of being that puppet master and creating violence for violence's sake. And, yeah, I just really liked how this was handled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it really does kind of play into the fact that Dario Cueto is the best written heel authority figure in wrestling since the original Mr. McMahon character. Oh, completely agree, and I think you phrased that just so perfectly, because I am just so engaged in everything that Cueto does. I have been saying, almost to really close every to it, wow, 
uh, you know, Cueto's got payback coming, but I just love, you know, his swagger, his confidence and how he leads this thing. And, and, you know, he knows he's in control. And even when he feels like he loses it, like he felt like he may have lost it here in this segment with Mundo and uh, Patron, because those are two guys you don't want to tick off. But even so, like he's never really at a disadvantage, even when you think he might be, because then look what he turned it into. Just such a great character. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I mean, if you want to move on, we can. Absolutely, man. What's our next segment? Well, the next segment is actually the first match. Our first match of the night, Son of Havoc and Angelico versus Cortez Castro and Mr. Cisco. You know what's funny is that I think what I really appreciated about this match, really reflecting upon it now after all this time, is I like how they didn't make it overly obvious that this team, you know, the team of Angelico, Son of Havoc, and Ivelisse, uh, still have kinks to work out. Like they, like they made it noticeable with the way on Helico and Son of Havoc would tag each other and this and that. But they actually gelled pretty well in this match. So it's not like they're trying to make overly obvious. Oh, oh look, see these guys struggling. See these guys in conflict. They know we're intelligent enough that we can take those cues, you know, at face value and say, yeah, this team's gotten better for sure. But they still have a long way to go. And I think that made it for a very interesting opening because I didn't know if they were going to implode, if maybe Evil Lease was going to distract either of the guys at a pivotal point because they were gelling together so well. And I wanted to see what would really curtail that momentum. So good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the little subtle kind of pot shots that Angelico and Son of Havoc were taking at each other. I think, although, I mean, that was cool. I think my favorite part of this match was Ivalice screaming at both of them from the outside. Yeah, I, I, I love it, man. Like, even though she's the wounded one in the group because she's dealing with that injury, yeah. uh, she still, you know, acts like she runs the place as she should. You know, that that's her whole thing, the baddest bitch in the building, and she doesn't kowtow to anybody. Um, you know, and, and really, it seemed like they were giving the crew – a hard time but what i what i liked about that though is that when the crew got in a rhythm all it took was one second because when son of havoc takes the tag from on helico towards the end and on helico in this match was on fire with those knee strikes he just like it, it, it gets better and better each time he's in the ring and like showing what he can do and getting the crowd behind him because they seem really into his stuff but Son of Havoc, I think, was the most over person in this match. The Temple has grown to just really love Havoc. I think he is a fan favorite by far. Oh, it's for sure. It's amazing how far he's come, and I love it. But yeah. he steals the tag from on Helico. On Helico, I, I love his other because he just tumbles out of the ring. He's like, I'm done. And he's yeah. just like, he's out. Well, no, that's the thing, dude. That's, that's actually a storyline point. He didn't just kind of randomly tumble out of the ring. Son of Havoc opened the ropes so that he would. Ah, see, I didn't quite... Yeah, that was Son that. of Havoc playing, like, a gag on Anelico, like, oh, you're getting ready to go up against the ropes, have a nice trip, see you next fall, and he falls <laughs> out, and it ended up screwing the team over, because on Helico then, because he fell so far, he didn't recover quickly enough to come back to help Son of Havoc, who was getting double teamed at the time. Yeah, he gets hit with the... Uh flabjack lung blower of the crew i love yeah. that double team move by the way i think it's one of it's my yeah it's it's, it's almost like a 3d except the lucha version yeah i think with all the tag teams that we've been getting and just like everywhere you know wb all these places i think that might be one of my favorite double team moves going just very yeah. uh, effective so yeah. nicely done and yeah they pin son of havoc so i I'm, that was a good catch by you Andrew, because i honestly thought it was just exhaustion from uh, uh, on helico because he was kind of playing that role of i gotta get the tag or i gotta fight these guys so good catch and yeah i think that just goes to show they didn't make it overly obvious with them screaming at each other or devolving into a to a brawl or whatever it was just the little nuance things and you see it like cost them the matchup so i think for that for the story they were telling i really enjoyed this opener yeah absolutely yeah i yeah it was it was a lot of fun um i think that little subtlety that you didn't even notice i think that was probably my favorite part of the match honestly yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, like I said earlier, that and Evilly shouting orders at these guys from the sides. Yeah, man. She's that so was good. great. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, all right. Well, up next, we had uh, a, another backstage segment from um, uh, Dario Cueto's office. Davari, though, this time shows up and then Cueto basically does all the talking here. He says that it takes some real cojones to show up after Tejano called you out. And uh, he, he does mention that He's surprised that Davari is here because he knows that he's quite successful and he doesn't need the money. 
And Davari just basically says, you like to watch violence. I like to inflict it. And Quaid is just like, all right, well, let's see how much, much violence you can inflict upon Tejano, who you're facing tonight. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I feel like the more time goes on, the more I've really developed an appreciation for the more uh, succinct style of promo cutting. Like, the only person oh, I, I think know. I can really... Yeah, I think the only person I can really appreciate any more cutting, like, a long-winded promo would be, like, a Bray Wyatt character, because I'm just so fascinated by him and, and enthralled by, you know, what he is. But for most guys, I feel like this works, because that one line, that one soundbite from Davari, uh, you know, you like to watch violence, I like to inflict it. Bam! Right there. That's great. Perfect. Done. And I, I think it says so much. And then, yeah, I like that he's just immediately throwing him, you know, that being Cueto, throwing Davari into the lion's den against Tejano straight away. And I think it just really sets a tone. And I just, I don't know, I, I like the aura that uh, Davari was kind of projecting, you know, with the phone and everything. He, in fact, he even raised his hand up to Cueto when he was trying to talk to him. I thought he was, like, tweeting or something or doing whatever. And you could tell, like, he's definitely very arrogant, got a chip on his shoulder. And he's coming here to make an impact, so we'll see what he does. Yeah, he's he's definitely, I mean, there was some definite disrespect going on there because it felt to me like he was just kind of like not paying attention to Cueto, like he was just there to get a, a fight lined up. And he, he didn't really care what Cueto had to say otherwise. Like, I don't know if he was tweeting or just texting, but there's definite disrespect implied by paying attention more to your phone than the guy you're having a business meeting with. Uh, absolutely. And I think the character of Javari for me became more intriguing when it came time for his match, which we'll talk about when we get into it. Um, but yeah, for the time being, this was a nice segment between the two. I enjoyed it. Yep, absolutely. Up next, we had another backstage segment, this time in the locker room. Uh, we had uh, Prince Puma and Conan, and Prince Puma wants to confront Hernandez. Puma or Conan is kind of trying to play referee, keep them at peace a little bit. And uh, Hernandez basically says that he's going to win the title and he wants to win it off of Puma. He doesn't want to try and force Puma to lose his title. And then next thing you know, Cueto shows up and he sets up a match where uh, Puma and Co uh, Hernandez are going to have to coexist because it's a freaking tag team match. And they're on one team going against uh, King Cuerno and Cage. So have fun, guys. Yeah, and that's pretty much what he does. Oh, and, and yeah, he leaves Conan with it, and if anybody can uh, work out the difference between these two, I know you can. So, good luck. And it's just like, you douchebag. Uh, but again, it just goes back to the, the marvelousness that is Dario Cueto, and Hernandez just wasn't having any of it. Like, you could tell he wants to rip Puma apart. Puma has no uh, fond feelings for Hernandez here. And Conan, he's kind of the looming question mark. And I know we've had conversations, you and I, as, as far back as uh, last week's Lucha Underground Toy Wow, about what role Conan is going to play and what we can anticipate from him. Uh, but he just seemed uh, so distressed. Like, I think he wants one cohesive unit rather than just one really dominant part. Nah, man, so, I'm telling so. you, I, I'm telling you, I smell a sneak in the grass. I, I do too, man. We'll just have to see if he strikes, though. That's the question. But for now, no. yeah, this was straight and to the point. I enjoyed it. Yep. I want, I kind of want Johnny Mundo to, like, overhear Hernandez and Conan plotting together without Puma being around and him be the voice of reason to get Puma to realize what's going on. That would be great because, I mean, hell, from the very beginning, Conan's yeah. been like, oh, you can't trust Mundo or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the thing because it's like how much is Prince Puma going to trust this guy when he's getting it pumped into his head constantly that he shouldn't? Exactly. Exactly. And so plus, I, I mean, there's a potential that it could lead to more Puma Mundo matches, and nothing's wrong with that at all. Oh, no, nothing's wrong with that whatsoever. <laughs> oh God. I, yeah. Well, you know what? I, I have a lot to say about that later, but you know, it would be completing the circle, which honestly, I, Lucha Underground's writing is, is so consistent and so competent. It wouldn't even surprise me if Mundo played a bigger role down the road to try and be the voice for for Prince Puma, just being like, "Hey, man, Conan's doing some shady stuff." You need to look out for yourself, and, and that kind of turns into a whole thing. It's going to be very interesting to see what the fallout of all of this is, because you know yep. something big is about to come. So. Absolutely, yep. All right, well, up next, we had our second match of the night, or I guess what was supposed to be our second match of the night, although the bell did ring, so I guess it was legal. It just didn't last very long. Davari versus Tejano, 
And this match lasted about 30 seconds before Tejano decides to shove the ref in his rage, learning a thing or two from Alex Riley there. Um, yeah, he, he shoves the ref and gets disqualified. So Davari has barely lifted a finger and he's 1-0 already in Lucha Underground. Uh, a couple mental notes I took for this segment. Uh, a, love that uh, his name is Delavar Davari, to be exact. That was his ring introduction, so we know yeah. the name he's going by. Two, love that he has a drink with him to the ring. It's like, yes. screw you and your Apple teenies, Christopher Daniels. This is what a man drinks. Yeah, and yeah, vodka on the, on the rocks. <laughs> or, now, actually, no, it's probably scotch if I had to guess. Now, I wanted to ask you something, Ashton, because I didn't I didn't want to know like if I was just like projecting or maybe if I was seeing things that weren't there. But is it just me, or has Davari bulked up? Because he, no, he seems like he got bigger. I, I think he looks pretty much the same size he was when he was Sheik she Abdul-Bashir. Really? Because, yeah, yeah I, I thought he got a little bit bigger to me, but he looks good nonetheless is what I'm really trying to I get. I think maybe, maybe a little bit less definition, maybe just like more just pure bulk rather than definition, but uh, he definitely doesn't look more ripped, I should say, than he right, did with right. Sheik Abdul-Bashir. I think that was – I would even argue that he looked more like defined and ripped and shredded back then than he does now. Right. But now he just looks bigger. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's good. I, I like his look. I, I like the whole persona. But now what's got me conflicted is Tejano rushes the ring, and he perpetrates the assault, and obviously, as you said, causes the DQ. Yeah. Uh, Divari does have a little bit of fight back, but he leaves the fight. He leaves the fight, and then he spits in Tejano's direction. So is he the heel here because he left the fight and Tejano stood his ground? I yeah, I think so. I think that they're kind of effectively pulling off a double switch here because – if you really think about it, Davari did everything heelish that a heelish guy can do in this match. And Tejano kind of had that babyface fire going on. So it does make sense that they would have opposite roles than what we expected. It's a relief to like have Davari so quickly defined. And I am used to him in that heel role. This yeah. is going to be di- – and what I like about this too, and this should be said um, – because you and I, we, we've, we've followed Devari. You even made the Sheik Abdul-Bashir reference in, in TNA when he was X-Division. I mean, all that stuff. It's refreshing to see that this gimmick isn't going to be like an anti-American kind of gimmick. This is oh, different yeah. for Devari. And I'm, I'm excited to explore it. So This I think- is fully realized, Devari. This is, he is an American. He has accepted American lifestyle. And he has excelled at it because he's a freaking rich guy. Yeah, <laughs> in that well he's he's <laughs> basically uh, an off-brand version of what alberto del rio was in wwe i know right don't be surprised if uh, if patron ever turns heel you see those two in a tag team or something and be like yeah we're the richest people in america and we're not even americans so suck on that um i'm rich enough in america that i could literally buy a city in mexico <laughs> yeah but like, so that I- that's the great thing too is that like even if you get like a Mexican native to be a heel and to be that kind of heel, which I mean, it's safe to say Davari isn't, but even if they would, they could use that sort of anti, not even anti, just like that, that, that racist view that Americans typically have that Mexico is somehow lesser. Right. Like, like even like the one joke in family guy where Peter's like, if you have sex, it turns straight in straights into gays and gays into Mexicans. Everyone goes a step down. Like that kind of thing would be such a great heel tactic for Lucha underground because it's such a great respectful place. And like the Mexican culture thrives so deeply in Lucha underground that that would get like more heat than anything ever. Oh, completely agree with you. And I would not be surprised if they tapped into that Avenue at all. But now we've got these kind of defined roles and really, for me, as the more casual viewer of, you know, Mexican promotions in Lucha Libre, it's great for Tejano because I wasn't really – I can't say that I've been accustomed to him being a heel. You know what I mean? Like I've only seen like the, the, those few uh, matches interactions. So him making the transition to babyface, I can get behind, and I think you can see that the people probably get behind it too for the reasons you stated if they tap into that avenue because then Tejano would be representing them in the temple. And I think uh, the, uh, the Lucha Underground faithful, so to speak, could very quickly get behind that. So I'm excited when they actually have an official match. Hell, give them a Boyle Heights street fight or something and let them go at it. And I, I think they could produce some quality television. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. All right, so up next, our third match of the night. And 
I was gonna say my favorite, but that main event though, just just so good. Um, King Cuerno <laughs> and Cage versus Prince Puma and Hernandez, as announced earlier, this match was so good. You know what? I feel like because here's the thing, I. I love the main event. <laughs> don't don't worry, we're, we're going to talk all about it. But I feel like this match was so much better from like the story perspective because you yeah. know again all that tension between Hernandez or as Mundo calls him Fernandez. I loved that so much too. He's pulling a Jericho. <laughs> I know. I was like, way to pull a Chris Jericho. But... Fan Dumbo. <laughs> Fan Dingbat. Yeah, like that. Like I love that shtick. Yeah, oh man, and the deliver that we both know that we're better than Fernandez. <laughs> <Just like dead. laughs> uh, and he but, uh, said it with such a straight face, too. It was like he honestly didn't know. It's like, and then they just decided to roll with it. But this match was great. And it's, it's Hernandez, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I love that Coyne put that in. Hernandez! Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I love the tension between these two Conan trying to, like, police and be like, hey, hey, work together, have teamwork. And obviously, of course, there's there's brilliant offense throughout. You know, Puma with his, uh, I think he did, like, a double kick at one point to both corners. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, was, that was probably my favorite Prince Puma spot of this match, where, like, the two guys are in the ring opposite him, and he kicks one in the chest, and then just, without even putting the foot down, brings it back to kick the other guy in the gut. And, like, just, he's so good. <laughs> it's not he even, is. It's not even fair. Like, Lucha Underground is, is so smart for picking him to be their guy. Because, like, honestly, at this point, I, I think WWE looks so stupid for not having signed him before Lucha Underground even got a chance. Uh, you know what? I, I found the mentality, because you and I would talk about that. Um, that they're like, oh, we have too many small guys in our locker room, if that's true. That, just the stupidity, I can't even begin. But, the real star here, that I want to take a, a well, good... Well, uh, wait a minute, if they have too many small guys, then why is Cage not already on the roster, for God's sakes? And I agree, Cage, don't even get me started on that. But because yeah. if, if the idea is, oh, we have too many small guys, well then, is it possible to have too many big guys? Because unless it is, he definitely should be on your freaking roster. Oh, they're just idiots, and Lucha Underground are geniuses, and we'll just leave it at that. I mean, a guy like Cage able to do a 619 and you have no interest in that? Yeah, get out of here. But um, uh, the real guy I wanted to praise here is freaking Hernandez. I know, because he's so good! I, and I'm going to give the ball to you in a second, because you were really gushing over him. I feel like you deserve the reins on this one, but I just have to say, because you and I have talked about it, he's 40, right? Like 40, 41? 40 40-something. 40 43, to, maybe. To, to, to be that age and still be so good in terms of your mannerisms and your character and to make your moments matter. 42, because Hernandez, beg pardon, 42? Yeah. A 42. So to be 42, to be in the business enough to know, it's not how many moments you can do in a match or spots if you prefer. It's making your spots matter. And holy shit, did Hernandez make his spots matter. He was the star absolutely in this match to me, and I feel like it won't take any time at all for him to be, like, the top heel here because he's just so good. But if you don't take my word for it, I mean, again, Astro was gushing over it, so I'm going to leave it to my cohort and commentary here. What did you love from Hernandez? Let's talk about him a little bit. Oh, my God. It, it's funny because it, I've said so many times, oh, that guy's my favorite guy in Lucha Underground, that guy's my favorite guy. I feel like I can't decide, but I really do think Hernandez is my favorite heel in this company. He is so freaking good. I love the cocky, arrogant little struts that he does and the facial expressions. And when he does a devastating move, how he just kind of like brushes it off like, oh, just another day at the office for me. I'm such a great freak anyway. Like, he's just so good. He's so natural. And I, again, like... <sighs> He was, he's so much better now than he was in TNA. <laughs> oh my, well, dude, again, the problem with TNA when he was in there, I'm not even saying that, like, that's his fault, but it's like, again, okay, how many explosive spots can I do? How exciting kind of matches can I have? And this match was great, and this match still delivered on that front, but Hernandez's job is to be that heel, is to be that type of character. My two favorite moments actually came in succession with each other, just to show how good Hernandez is, because King Cuerno is about to do his uh, his slingshot suicide dive, like that, yeah. that arrow. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And 
Hernandez is like, oh, that looks like it'd be pretty devastating. Well, I'm out of here. And he just pulls Puma into the move, and he yeah. saunters off. Yeah, he like, literally threw Puma into the line of fire. Like, like yeah, thanks for eating the spot, kid. Yeah. <laughs> And then when he's down, and I love this too because I'm I'm sorry, like Ashton knows me pretty intimately. People who know me pretty intimately know I gravitate towards douchebags. I don't know what it is. He really I does. Find... He really, I... really does. I mean, Seth Rollins is his favorite guy on the roster right now, guys. Put that into perspective. I found it hilarious, and I don't even have anything against Puma. You're probably all thinking, oh, well, he beat Mundo for the Lucha Underground Championship. He has a vendetta. No, I like Puma, but I laughed my ass off when Hernandez is just looking at Puma, and Puma's like, what are you doing? And he just kicks him in the face, and then he picks him up, and he border tosses him on the apron. Oh, (laughs) man. Just brutal, too, because, like, it's like the whole time Puma was just refusing Hernandez's help, and this might not have even been a sort of a planned assault. Like he might not have even been planning on turning on Puma, but he just got so sick of his shit that he just like, screw you, kid. If you wanna, if you don't want my help, then I'm gonna help the other team. <laughs> I'm laughing about it, just thinking about it, because then when Conan is kind of, you know, lecturing him, giving him a tongue line, he'd be like, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hernandez just throws his arms up, and he's like, what's up? What's up, old man? You want some of this? And he just walks off. He's like, screw you guys. And then Cuerno gets uh, Puma back in the ring, and that's when Cage is able to hit Weapon X. So, and then Cage pins the Lucha Underground champion. And that's another thing I love about Lucha Underground, too, right? Because you have Hernandez, who won his triple threat match last week. You had the whole main event with Mundo and Patron, which we'll, which we'll get to. Oh, man, are we going to get to it? Um, but then you have tonight, you know, Cage pinning Puma. It's like Lucha Underground knows how to keep multiple people strong at one time. So at any point, if you want to throw them in that title picture, it makes sense. Yep. Like now, if Cage was to get a future title shot, I wouldn't have any qualms about it, even though they really just did get done their beef a little bit ago, you know, their program. Cage could be right back in it now because he pinned the champion. I yep. love that Lucha Underground is like, keep only one person strong at a time. Screw that. Try like five or six. It's like, it's crazy how many people could be put in the title picture tomorrow. And I could believe that. And that is the sign of a strong promotion. So, And I think that's something that does apply to NXT as well. Just not so much the main roster for WWE. Yeah, yeah, definitely, dude. Absolutely. Because, uh, like, with Lucha Underground, we've got Cage, we've got Cuerno, we've got Mundo, and, and El Patron, and you could even say, like, Phoenix. Yeah, like, there's there are options. And then you look at NXT, and they have Balor, and they have, Z- well, I guess, can we count Zayn? I think so, probably. And then you have Neville. Yeah. Not really Neville anymore, but... You know, they've got the Baron Corbin. They've Their options are starting to dwindle because of call-ups. But, you know, uh, I would say maybe like three months ago, they had just a ton of options. And now, even still, Lucha Underground has a ton of options. And I think that's something that really does make the product as a whole better. Because it's like, any given week, you could see somebody step up to the champion and be like, okay, okay, yeah, I can, I can get into this. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Phoenix is another one that I was thinking of. Like... Yeah. He's kind of fallen off the radar a little bit, but if he was to be brought back next week, he'd be like, oh, you have an opportunity to be a contender. I could, I, yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. Uh, so that's what's just so great about Lucha Underground, and I love it in this tag match. And, and Hernandez, just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Up next, we had probably my favorite part of the night, Angela Fong cinematic. Yeah. She has a bag. She uh, she zips it up. She seems like she's gonna leave, but uh, you know she gets stopped. El Dragon Azteca. El Dragon Azteca. That's right. And he says, you know, I, I can't permit you to leave. You know, you're not ready. I'm not gonna have what happened to your parents happen to you. And uh, he says, look, if you can get by me, you can leave. Because actually, he said, if you can take me down, you can leave. Yeah, if you could take me down, you can leave. And Angela Fong tries. I mean, she tries. Really, but, really hard, but he blocks every single attempt with one freaking arm. Yeah, I love how little things like that just really communicate the disparity in their skill level. Yeah, it's because like a freaking Mr. Miyagi, man. I love it. Exactly, because, like, they don't even want to kind of imply that Angela Flong uh, yet 
is on equal footing with Azteca. And and they do a great job because what she well yeah because does, like here's my thing like if if Azteca is this big badass why doesn't he just go take out Matunza himself? And see I'm trying to wonder that too Matunza uh well well not Matunza Azteca even though Matunza is a big question mark a very big quite literal question mark uh, Azteca he's probably the most intriguing player in the game and yeah it's weird for me to say that knowing that Matunza's a thing because. Matanza, to me, his motivation is very straightforward. I, I'm guessing that he's just a beast that loves destruction. That's why he needs to be locked up. Well, no, <laughs> see, but that's the thing, John. This is Lucha Underground. You can't make presumptions like that. And you can't, and you can't, and you can't. But that's the presumption I make for the moment. But Azteca, the problem is I can't even – I don't even know the jumping off point. What is his motivation? Yeah. Exactly. Like, he's such an enigma. But I love it, though. Yeah. That's... Because can Because here's the question I pose to you. <laughs> Right, and, and yeah. then, like this, this is what I, like this is the question I pose to you. He's helping Angela Fawn, but is he really the hero of this story? Because that's what Lucha Underground does to me. Like, is he not just maybe another villain with his own motivations? I don't know, um, but I'm dying to find out. <laughs> For sure. And that's I, that's like you said, that's what Lucha Underground does. Like you, I, you, you can't trust anybody anymore. It, it, yeah, I know, right? Like, it messes with me, man. It's like, oh, we're going to do Lucha Underground. I, I even, like, feel I feel so like freaking like Prince now. Puma, Prince Puma is going to, like, tear his mask off and reveal, oh, my God, it was Dario Cueto the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just, and yeah, it's like, I'm so, I, like, I treat my words like landmines anymore when we're yeah. reviewing Lucha Underground. I'm like, Pfft. I totally know what's going to happen and every time, every freaking time. It's like they're sitting back there and they're laughing at us. Cause it's, <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. It's like amateur hour compared to what we're actually doing. And I love it though, man. I love, uh, I love feeling like I'm actually like, how do I put this? Cause when it comes to WWE, I can like, and most people can, most people that have, any degree of experience with wrestling, with drama television, with soap operas, for God's sake, can look back and be like, oh, well, that was a stupid storyline. This is how you could have fixed it. Neither one of us can do that with Lucha Underground, ever. Like, there have been very, very, very few instances of us feeling as though we could write the show better than the writers are writing the show. And that's such a great feeling to have. Because in WWE, there are so freaking many instances where we're like, well, you did this, and then you did that, and you did that, but why didn't you just do this instead? And it, it would have made sense, and it would have achieved the same thing, and you would have spilled, you know, it would have filled this much time, and, like, it could have achieved the same thing, but in a better way that made more sense and didn't ignore certain things like continuity and that kind of thing. But Lucha Underground, it's like, we're, rather than us trying to do their jobs for them, we're just kind of sitting back and be like, okay, you guys are way better than this at us, and we're just going to let you do it. Yeah, I, you know, it's... It's so crazy because you have WWE that I feel like you can have your finger pretty firmly on the pulse in most cases yeah. and know where they're going. But then but then on the other extreme, here's the thing. On the other extreme, you have TNA that does really out there things like saying make Eric Young TNA champion for a ratings pop for one week. And then you have Lucha Underground in the middle that knows how to walk that line, how to tell a consistent, coherent narrative while still keeping it suspenseful. Well, and, and the beautiful thing I think about Lucha Underground, too, and it's something that I think TNA and I think even ROH have adopted, no pay-per-views. Yeah. No pay-per-views. So basically they get to treat every show like its own version of a pay-per-view. Now, that being said, they do have shows that are – treated like pay-per-views like there were a couple shows last month i believe it was or maybe march i think it was that were sort of like a three-parter of a, of what would have been a pay-per-view and we've got ultima lucha in august but other than that it's it's a tv show that gets treated like a pay-per-view because every week there are these amazing amazing what i think most people would call pay-per-view quality matches but at the same time, it's like a TV show in that they're also constantly setting up for not even just the following week, but weeks in advance. Oh, yeah, dude. It, it is crazy to me. And the really scary part about Lucha Underground, and by that I mean scary good, uh, is that the best stories aren't even the ones necessarily taking place, you know, in the ring, but outside it. You know, again, Matunza 
Angela Fong, Dario Cueto in that damn key. And like, I know, Johnson, yeah. yeah well, you, like, you kind of got to figure that the key is the key to Matunza's prison cell now, right? R- right, right, yeah. You would think, but it's you, Lucha you, Underground, so you can't make that presumption. Yeah, it's like, we're saying this, and they're just somewhere tisking, and like, if only you knew. Yeah, uh, like, they're, like, twiddling their thumbs. And I still haven't forgotten when Cueto was looking over some papers, and he said, the gods are not going to be happy about this. What gods?! What, what is going on? What is I wonder, this place? That's a, like, I wonder if El Dragon Azteca is one of the gods that he was referring to. I, I mean, you know, maybe, like, I'm going to make somewhat of an out there reference, but I know you've referenced this show before in time about Lucha Underground. You know, when you think about Lost, and the whole question was, what the hell is this island? Well, my question is, what the hell is this temple? Yeah. Like, I don't even really know what it is. <laughs> and that that's crazy, because, like, does the temple have any grander meaning? And when Azteca asked us on the first episode, and he asked when he, you know, opened the trunk and Angela Fong was in there, and, you know, thankfully he was able to get to his destination with no cops stopping him. I was like, what do you know about Lucha Libre? Apparently nothing. Apparently nothing, because every guess I've taken, I have been wrong. So I love it, man. The storytelling they do, even with things, again, bringing it full circle with just the basic heel kind of story like i want your title i'm gonna take it and conan in the middle you know with hernandez and puma they just do it in such a way that, that it, it feels fresh it's exciting and i can get behind it uh just love it man so much yeah absolutely oh, man okay now let's move on let's move on to our main event match of the evening oh man Alberto El Patron versus Johnny Mundo. The winner faces Hernandez next week to determine the number one contender for the Lucha Underground Championship. So let's be clear. This isn't even a number one contender match. This is a contender for the number one contender match. Yeah. And wow. Yeah. What a great matchup between these two guys. Um, I gotta tell you, man, ever since Patron has come to Lucha Underground, I feel like I can reinvest in him and get into his matches. Uh, and, and this was just such a great outing. Uh, it, it was such a great matchup that it, it took the taste out of my mouth from that squash match they had back in WWE that was only 30 seconds. Like, this is the match I know they're capable of putting on with each other. And it was just so good. Uh, I loved Patron early on because he had... Mundo so well scouted, he was going to do, I think, like a corkscrew over the rope, presumably, but uh, Patron opens up the apron, and he does that apron trap maneuver that Heel Finley used to do, and he kicks him in the chest. That was a great spot. Um, Mundo, just with his high flying in general, he did a corkscrew over the ropes, and he landed on his feet. And I love the confidence of Mundo, too, because he's adopted, I guess, a new saying. When he was really in control of the matchup, he would beat his chest and go, this is my world. You know, like asserting that dominance. I really, really like that. And um, I love the tension, like in, like in each near fall. Uh, you know, they, they really built it up. Like these are two guys. They know how good um, they are. They've had these interactions backstage. Now it's time to find out who the best really is. And I think both performers really got treated with the dignity that they deserved. They seemed like equals. It wasn't like, oh, look at Mundo trying to overcome the AAA champion. No, they seemed like they were on the same level with each other. And I, I loved it, man. It was such a great main event. Yeah, absolutely. This was an amazing match. And, I, man, these guys have such good chemistry. Oh, I want to see more from these two. And I think you will. I'm hoping we do because, I mean, yes, from the Mark perspective, <laughs> the finish did leave me a bit sour. Why is uh, that, John? Why is that? Uh, <laughs> all right, look at you. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, the way they got there, though, I really appreciate it because uh, Mundo does hit the end of the world at one point, yeah. and I, I popped. Cause, oh, my God. We're going we're to do it. We're going to do it. And no, hand on the ropes. Uh, which was yeah. great because it shows like he has the ring awareness and it shows like if he was just a little bit further away, and, it would have been enough to beat him. Well, yeah, and I was going to say not only that, but it also shows that Johnny Mundo might lack a little bit of ring awareness because he didn't even hook the outside leg. He did not, no. I think he had that sense of urgency to beat Patron and he wasn't even really taking in his environment. Uh, but then Patron gets probably one of the best um, arm breakers in terms of like how he applies it because it's just so sudden. He catches him. And I love that because it kind of like had that ankle lock kind of vibe. Like at any time, I could have you like that. 
and I love that. So we had him, and I'm like, oh, please don't tap. Please, please don't give him the submission victory. Like, these guys have been on such equal footing. And Mundo actually reverses uh, his body a little bit, and I guess with that quote-unquote parkour training, he's able to get his feet on the ropes with the contortions of his body and everything. And Patron can't believe it. Like, he exploded. Uh, then they, my heart caught in my throat because he's getting frustrated with the referee. He hangs Mundo up in the tree of woe. He goes to dive, but he hits the ring post. Something is going to hit a second end of the world, and that's the finish. But no, Mundo's selling the arm. He does a double stomp to Patron's back. That gets a near fall. So I'm like, oh man, how is this going to end? And then uh, Patron gets the kneeling kick. You Whoa! Know, like, you you nice. completely you completely skipped the entire sequence that led up to that though. It was so good. Oh, like the sunset flip teases and everything, like the back yeah, the back. and he like yeah. he went for the kick on the kneel, and he he dodged it, and then Johnny Mundo went for the flying chuck and rolled through it, and then he ended up eating the kick, and just just so good. And then I like the Patron couldn't even really make a cover; he more like collapsed on Mundo. Yeah, and he got the win. It was so deflating because I even told you it wasn't even about the Lucha Underground Championship because I know I know that um. Hernandez Puma is the end game. It's yeah. just the idea. Patron is that one guy I've always wanted to see uh, Mundo beat because of the whole squash match on Raw and everything like that. And after this chemistry, like, I want them to have another match and I just one win. It's like Rock Austin for me or like Michael's Taker. Michael's got obsessed with beating The Undertaker. I'm getting obsessed on Mundo's behalf for him to beat Patron and it just didn't happen tonight. Damn. But yeah. so good, though. Damn you, Lucha Underground. <laughs> <laughs> they know, they know I'm not going anywhere, so they can torment me this way, and I won't even do anything about it. It was such a good main event. Yeah, absolutely, it was awesome. So now Patron, I mean, we gotta, I guess, talk about the extra curricular circumstances here because now Patron next week faces Hernandez. So the Triple A champion, if he can beat Hernandez. He's very close to unifying those two belts. You know, amusing that we kind of had when we knew that Triple A would kind of snuggle up a little closer to Lucha Underground here. So, but I do think Hernandez will overcome. It's just a question of how will he? Because Patron is definitely like he is that guy. I think when you beat him, it's a very big deal. So, how is Hernandez going to do it? Yeah, that's the question. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, that's not all we have, John. No, it's not. You said extracurricular. We've got extracurricular activity going on after this match. Oh, yeah, we do, because that closing segment, I mean, and tell the people, not, man. It's not just any extracurricular activity. It's the reincarnation of Mil Muertes. Oh, my God. I know, dude. Oh, my God. This was so good and so creepy. And he's wearing contacts now, so he looks undead or even more undead than he did before. So it's like a newer, more powerful zombie version of freaking <laughs> Mil Muertes as if he needed to be stronger in the first place. But see, I love that, though, right? Because I'm sure you'd have people look at the Mil Muertes character and maybe, maybe, I'm just making an assumption here based on, you know, a lot of the voices that you and I see on the internet say, I don't like Mil Muertes, you know, losing the way that he does or this, that, or the other. But as Katrina kind of explained, him losing the way that he did in this Grave Consequences match has made him now even stronger. Yeah. Because now he's beyond both life and, and death. death. Oh my god. I, I don't envy anyone right now, because if Hernandez really thinks that he's going to be able to just enjoy a one-on-one -on -one match with Puma and just ride off into the sunset with that championship, I think Mil Muertes is finally going to have something to say about it, because, oh my god. Yeah, I um, mean, can we, uh, can we kind of agree Mil Muertes may be next world champ? Definitely. I, I well, here's the thing, dude. I mean, I was, I believe, I was the one. I don't know if you signed on to that with me. At we, the time. yeah, we were both yeah. definitely, yeah, 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 inaugural champion. But that went to uh, that went to Puma, and I, I don't think either thinking, one of us has complained about it going to Puma. It's just no. that it was an option that we would have enjoyed if it would have gone to to Muertes. Yeah, I mean, we just saw him like bulldoze and everybody. And see, that's the thing. Like Mil Muertes before wasn't even a joke. I mean, very legitimate and could destroy everybody. But when you hear Katrina talk about it, that he's gone through this process now and it's time to rise again and the candles and just the atmosphere was perfect. Like, holy crap, man. I want his first match back to be against Phoenix and I want him to freaking destroy him. 
Yeah, I mean, really, I love Phoenix to death, and I really do feel like he's owed a title shot. But Speaking more of case, Phoenix, yeah. though, whatever happened to the whole Katrina Phoenix thing? Weren't they an item? He was used, man. Used. Oh, that's that's right. Yeah, because she's literally just she literally used him to kill Mil Morte so that she could reincarnate him even stronger than he was before. So really, in a very odd way, this was probably the greatest act of devotion Katrina could have shown Mil Mortes. Yeah. Yeah. How do I show I care? I'm gonna make you even stronger. Phoenix wasn't a human being, just the final instrument in the ultimate destruction of us all. <laughs> it's so oh like my that. god, my mind just got blown when we had that little realization right there. Oh, Dude, god. I, look, I just, look, from TwitWow to you, whoever Mil Muertes' first victim is, it was probably a good run. And, and, and I'm sure you would have enjoyed it. It's over. Because he's going to kill anybody. I'm telling you, I can't wait for this. I even, I think I even said after Grave Consequences, it terrifies me what's going to rise from that casket. And, yeah, feelings validated. Oh, man. Jesus. Or should oh. I say Mil Muertes? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you better say Mil Muertes. Holy crap. Uh, I feel like if I don't, he's going to grab me by the throat and be like, say my name. <laughs> and they still got that stone and, oh, man. Oh, man. You know, it, it's great to, I got I to say, too, as like a guy that's watched WWE for so many years, it's so great to get excited again about a character like this, seeing as how, you know, The Undertaker is what he is now, so old and only competing like once a year. I will uh, say this, though. I will say this. Yeah. I hope. I hope that Katrina cuts a promo explaining the whole thing with Phoenix. Yeah. Explaining that she did what she did because she needed somebody to put Mil Mortes away in that casket for good. Because she right. needed that to make him even stronger. Oh, God. Because, like, I, I feel like that's us speculating. I want it to be in freaking writing i want it to be known i want to just not be speculating i want it to be a fact yeah absolutely i i, I mean you know they, they even talked about that clash you know uh, between phoenix and Muertes. you know the, the the man who's you know died a thousand deaths and and you know the man that just you know always rises from the ashes so you know like yeah I, I do think phoenix was that vital ingredient i think just katrina needs to make that explicitly clear so we'll see if she does yeah. All right. All right, man. Uh, I guess moving on to our next segment, high spots and low shots. Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to say that my low shot was uh, Son of Havoc because his, you know, joking around that you, you pointed me to, uh, had him eat the pin from the crew, and he negated the aid of his own partner that maybe he could have broken up the pin. So, yeah, a rough night for him. But I'm sure I'll bounce back. But yeah, he is my low shot tonight. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to make Phoenix my low shot. <laughs> yeah. Because his worst nightmare just came to fruition. I think he was walking back somewhere and he just felt like a pang in his heart. It's like, I sense a disturbance. And in he's the just force, like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, who, so who is your low shot, though, man? Um, Man, who was yours again? My low shot was Son of Havoc. Okay, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to make my low shot Johnny Mundo because he tasted it and just couldn't get a hold of it. I know. Can I just say, though, I'm, I'm glad you had to plunder the knife so I didn't have to. So I know, I know, yeah, yeah. I, I saved you that. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll tell you what, I am in such a good mood, I am going to invoke an honorary high spot, and I am going to give it to Mel Muertes. Yeah. Because not for anything done in the present, but for the assured destruction that awaits us all in the future. Yeah. And as far as my actual high spot, Hernandez. Oh, because you took it from me. <laughs> I, I know. I know you probably wanted it bad, but I'm sorry, man. Like, such a great night for him tonight. Such a great character. Loved what he did in this tag match. And I would not complain at all if he was the guy to take the championship off Prince Puma. He has done exceptional work. I think I've done this before, but I'm going to do it again. My high spot is Dario Cueto. Wow, okay. Yeah. Because here's my thing. The crew beat Son of Havoc and Angelico. That's 
win number one for Cueto because they're like his dogs in this race. Um, Puma and Hernandez are breaking apart and Cueto hates Puma and he doesn't have a problem with Hernandez. So that's working out for him. Um, Davari and Tejano got into a violent fight. He loves violence. Um, <laughs> Cuerno and Cage beat Puma and Hernandez. So that's another win. And he hates Johnny Mundo almost as much as he hates Puma. So like literally Cueto's batting a thousand tonight. Oh, and by the way, no freaking Mer- Muertes is back. And he's probably going to go on a destruction. Uh, 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 what do you even call that? Uh, the what do you? Carnage. Yeah, I don't even know what to call it, but he's going to kill every baby face in the locker room and give Cueto a hard on for it. Yeah, I, I mean, look, if Cueto loves violence, Muertes is going to deliver to him a slaughter. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, my God. Don't say slaughter. That's Matanza. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm starting no, to think literally, that literally, even... Matanza is Spanish for slaughter. Well, regardless, man, he may not have to get, take a number and get in the back of the line because Muertes might have something to say about that. But what if he is Matanza? Oh, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Like, you, you pose that question, what if he is Matanza? Da, da, da. Like, I don't freaking know. Well, no, I mean, maybe this version of Mil Muertes is Matanza. I don't know, maybe maybe Cueto and Mundo are Long Law's brothers, and he envies Mundo because he's getting the family inheritance or something. I don't freaking know anymore. Like, no, it makes so much sense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just such a, a, a mind screw-up. Like, what I don't if, even know how to if, think. What if Matanza and El Dragon Azteca are secretly brothers? I know, right? Or, or what if... Uh, El Dragon Azteca, like, what if he groomed Matanza or something, and now this is just him repaying for his sins trying to help Angela Fong get closure? Oh, I... yes, he was his master! Yeah! <sighs> oh, this is so good! I don't even know what to do with myself. I never know what to do with myself when we do these reviews. So... It is literally <laughs> the lost of the wrestling world. <laughs> I can't, it, it, it is. What the hell is that temple? And, and who the hell is Marty the Moth Rodriguez? Like, I, oh, I can't wait to see him again. I, 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 I don't, I don't even. And it's know. not Rodriguez; it's Martinez. Mar- well, you know he's crazy. So that's he's not crazy. He's just, you know, a little overly eccentric. enthusiastic. Eccentric. <laughs> eccentric. Well, look. Do you have anything else you want to say about this? bad shit wonderful program oh that you just described it perfectly i'm not gonna open my mouth all right well guys with that said this has been lucha underground this has been twit wow the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today i'm john that's my cohort and commentary ashton guys be sure to comment and subscribe on youtube What did you think of Lucha Underground this week? Are you as lost as we are mentally? What do you think of the reborn Mil Muertes? Are are you as terrified as I am? Uh, Who do you think is going to really emerge facing Prince Puma? Talk to us about all of your favorite moments from Lucha Underground this week. Be sure to take the conversation over to Puitoff, an amazing pro wrestling group on Facebook. A lot of Lucha Underground lovers there as well. Get to interact with them, do all that stuff. Or if you just want to keep the conversation to TwitWow over here, me and my cohort in commentary, Ashton has created a TwitWow subreddit that you can all check out to do just that. And we will see you again for our NXT review, where Sami Zayn looks to continue to gain his edge over Kevin Owens. Until then, guys, tune in and peace out.